you're watching our brand new show Melt. I'm Ritvika Gupta and on this show we promise to bring you the best from the world of marketing, advertising and media. And of course joining me today is the editor of Melt, Anant Rangaswamy. Hi Anant. Hello. So Anand, um, let me begin by asking you, since there are already a number of similar shows that are airing on TV, so why don't you tell our viewers what is Melt and what sets us apart? Well, you said similar shows. There are no similar shows. That's the first thing. Yeah, so, no, there are lots of shows which cover advertising, certainly media and brands to some extent, but most of the shows focus on the pretty part of the business, right. which is the external manifestation of all the efforts of marketing, which is the ad itself. Right. So you look at ads and uh, there's not much that you learn from a show. It's a nice show, you feel good watching it. And uh, what is the takeout after the show that you saw three nice ads? And uh, that's, I think, passe. It was the kind of format or content uh, base that was needed many, many years ago. And I think that's content which appeals to Possibly nobody in marketing today. Okay. So today, I think what marketers need is uh, content that helps them navigate a very complex environment that they live in. You know, uh, the speed of change in marketing is frenetic, it's frightening. Mm -hmm. And uh, marketers really don't know what to do sometimes. For example, uh, let's say on a single day, they can read about how television doesn't work. Yep. about how print is dead, about how uh, viewers have an attention span of a goldfish. And on the other hand, they can see a new three minute film made by a brand. So I think what we're going to attempt to do in the show is through conversations with experts and people who know more than most people, uh, try and bring out uh, routes to make marketing simple or to navigate this complex world. Great. So tell us, uh, who is going to be the first guest of our first episode of Melt? Sure. Now, uh, I had a fantastic conversation with the legend of this business, a gentleman called Chuck Porter. Now, uh, maybe uh, the interview with Chuck that I have it will uh, show how Melt is different from other shows or different from uh, how uh, other medias curate their content. Now, Chuck has been, he came to India and he's been interviewed by all major publications, he's appeared on TV and what you get out of him on other shows or other media is the soft side of advertising, again the pretty side of advertising. What we hope to get out of him in the conversation that we have is the complexity of, me of marketing made simple. Mm -hmm. Chuck tells you about what the future is, he gives you insights into where he thinks uh, advertising is headed and uh, some fantastic one-liners. In fact, I, I saw about 20 one-liners I could extract from a 20-minute conversation. There's a sort of wonderful heightening of the nimbleness that you require in advertising today. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, you know, you'll hear more about it in the conversation. Great. So let's quickly dive in. Uh, Chuck Porter, Chairman, Partner, Crispin Porter and Bogaski in conversation with Anand Rangaswamy. Let's get ready to melt with Chuck Porter. Chuck, uh, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming to India. So Chuck, tell me, uh, let's start with the motherhood. Uh, what is the state of advertising, the advertising agency business uh, from your perspective? Well, I don't have any idea. You know, I, I, think, I think right now it's all over the place. I think that it's, everybody knows that, that the traditional agency business, the way it existed 15 or 20 years ago, is kind of going away. I think you know there there used to be a hundred in the U.S. There used to be eighty or a hundred very big accounts. Now maybe there are twenty. Everything is fragmenting. So um, I think the state of the business right now is there's a lot of fear and a lot of bewilderment and a lot of trying to figure out what are we going to do next. And, and again, I'm speaking about the U.S., but also markets, other markets that I know other than Brazil which I think is an aberration. But other markets that I know, um, I think agencies are trying to figure out how to make something that clients want to buy. Right. I think that's the issue. Sure. Now, having said that, uh, it's a bit of a contrarian position because companies still need to sell brands and products. 
and somebody's got to help them sell brands and products. So if the advertising agency business is in trouble or goes kaput, who's going to help the marketer? I mean, that's the concern. Well, you know, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that, that marketers have to market. And right. people who make things and create services have to figure out a way to get them known and to sell them. You know, the old sort of adage that if you make something better, if you make a better mousetrap, the world will, you know, everyone will know about it. That's simply not reality. There are a million apps out there right now that could be brilliant. They could be way better than their competition or the, the things that they've been designed to replace, but no one knows about them. Right. So marketing is, is probably more important than ever, but marketing is very different than it used to be. You can't, you know, and again, I'm speaking sort of from the perspective of, of the US and of Western Europe, you can't say, okay, we're gonna spend X million dollars on television and we know it will do this, because it won't. So I think that, I think marketers are just as afraid as agencies are. Marketers read the same newspapers we do, and they're looking and they're saying, I know there's a better way to do this, I just don't know what it is. Right. Um, social media is gigantic. So I think that the agencies that succeed or the, the creators that succeed are the ones who are gonna figure out what is the smartest way to market in the world today. And it's not the way it was yesterday. And I think that technology is gonna play a huge role. I think technology, we are at our agency right now looking at very new ways of measuring using technology rather than focus groups and things like that. Um, that give us real answers as to what kind of content people respond to. I don't know if that's a good answer, but I think, oh, it helps, I think certainly. That, that's what people are but, seeking. So that brings me to the next question. You know, 30 years ago, you could buy you know, an Al Ries and Jack Trout book, or you buy Kotler, and you could read it, and if you read it well, you become a good marketer. Today, there's no book I can buy and become a good marketer. So what's the playbook now? <laughs> I, well, part of the problem, I think, is that it's a moving target. Right. You know, the world is going to be different next week than it is today. One sort of basic philosophy I've always had in this business, when I first joined the Crispin Agency and became Crispin and Porter, I, I was a freelance writer for 17 years. I had never run an agency. So I thought, okay, I better go to all these meetings and see what's going on. And I spent a week going to meetings, and I realized we're not actually doing anything here. So I made a rule in the agency. I said, what we're going to do is do something brilliant today. We're not going to worry about tomorrow or next week. We're not going to do one or two year plans of how right. to grow. We're going to do something brilliant today and tomorrow will take care of itself. And it worked for us. And I think that's more true than ever right now. I think people, I think smart creatives are going to look at all the tools that are available, all the technology that's available, and figure out, okay, what do we do with this all right now to make something brilliant today? Um, and I think that it is, people are making it up as they go along. And, and I think that that's why uh, a lot of, I, I have been surprised that there haven't been more new agencies or new enterprises emerging who embrace that. Right. I know that that's what we're trying to do. Right. You know, part of your, your uh, conversa conversation we had in the car on the way here was you convinced uh, Alex to come back. Yes. What was the need to convince him to come back? Well, I mean, it was, I think, you know, Alex has spent the last eight years mostly uh, doing startups, funding startups. And he and I have done it together because, you know, we've, we've stayed very close over this time. And we've, he has discovered and together we have funded some advertising technology startups. And, and I think that the startup mentality, um, which is the whole idea of make mistakes fast, um, and then get by them and do the next thing, rather than saying, okay, we're gonna do a one-year plan. We're gonna have a new strategy. We're gonna spend one year rolling it out, and it's all or nothing. It's much better to say, let's try this, let's try this, and fail real fast so you can do something else. That's what the startup mentality is, and I think that Alex has learned um, an awful lot about that and embraced it, and I think that that's what agencies need to do. I think agencies need to explore new ways to create content, new ways to measure it, new ways to, to get it dispersed to the audience, and, and that's what we're gonna be doing. So we have, 
we're making dramatic changes right now in both the structure and um, and the the capabilities of the agency. Right. Um, to, I mean, I think what advertisers want right now, a lot of advertisers, is they want smart, fast, nimble, and prolific. They want to see a lot of work. They want to turn it around fast. Um, they want you to be able to be very flexible. And I think that that's what smart agencies or whatever is going to be the, the next step for agencies, I think that's what they're going to be about. Yeah, the resistance to that is, you know, with all the technology available in the world, uh, the finite time to get a great idea is finite time and that can't be crunched. You can crunch, for example, the time it takes to make a film or the production side of things, but how do you, how do you deal with, uh, you need, for example, 20 years ago you needed one week after the brief. Does that one week become two days after the brief now? I think that that is, I think that's a really interesting question because in my experience, you never know. Um, however, most of the great ideas that I think we've had have come very quickly. Right. Um, you know, we used to have a, a sort of a saying in the agency that the best work is done when the client's waiting in the lobby. Right. Um, so, so we've always worked very quickly and I have never seen, I have seen more often time help to soften an idea and make it weaker rather than making it better. Um, so nobody knows where a great idea is going to come from, but I think that, I don't think that time is, is a necessary element. I think it's more talent and instinct. Um, and also, things move so fast. You know, the, the people's memory now is so short and so quick. And you know, I think that it used to be that consistency for a, for a marketer, consistency was very important. I don't think it is anymore. I think consistency is good, but surprise is better. Unexpectedness um, is, I think, a more important element in marketing now. So it's interesting, a, a, a guy by the name of Kevin Aloka, who used to be the, the YouTube monitor at Google, um, and he would follow YouTube trends, and, and he plotted it all, um, and did an analysis of it, and he found that the three things that tended to create viralness, spike viralness, were celebrity, community, and unexpectedness. And in my view, you know, anybody can hire a celebrity. Anybody can create a, a community of users. The reason advertising agencies e exist is the third one, unexpectedness. We can create ideas that people don't expect to see, and that's what sticks in their head. Right. Now, that was a very long answer to no, a No, 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 no I, think, I think I don't mind the long answer because okay. I think it'll help my viewer. Part of the problems with, with this uh, digital age and, and you know, uh, like you're saying, the, the new paradigm for marketers that they should look for uh, elements of surprise, which is more important than consistency and so on, is measurement. Are they over-measuring everything that, everything that is created? All creativity, are they over-measuring creativity? And is that right, wrong? How would you react to that? Here's what I think. I think that you cannot trust what people say um, because they won't necessarily tell you the truth. And that's why I think we never use focus groups um, because I think, you know, if you look at, I think probably to me, the ultimate demise of measuring what people say was the last election in the U.S. Everybody said, I'm not going to vote for Trump, and they voted for him. The same thing in the UK with Brexit. Nobody thought Brexit would pass. Nobody thought it would pass. Not even Martin Sorrell. Well, I, he I, got a bad, that was a bad pun. Well, I mean, Both bad puns. It, 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 you know, they, because people don't say what they really mean or, or what they really think. They say what they think will make them look good. You know? so, so you can't trust what people say, but you can trust what people do. And that's why when Cambridge Analytica um, got a hold of all of that data from Facebook, they had something that was magic because they actually saw what people did. Not what they said they were going to do, but what they actually did. And that's hugely valuable. So I think that, that there are new technologies available now in order to measure the impact of creative based on what people actually do rather than what they say. And, and that's kind of the stuff that we're employing now. I mean, there are algorithms that exist now that allow you to test a creative idea very fast, very inexpensively, and get 
instant feedback about what people actually do. Right. And I think that's going to be more and more important. But I think that in terms of trying to, trying to measure creative itself in the process, that's impossible to do. No matter how much big data you have, big data can't create. That's an art. If, if big data could create, every songwriter would be John Lennon. Right. Because they'd all know how to do it. Right. So I don't know. It's, I, I'm not sure if that answer is clear enough. But why, why Lennon and not McCartney? I mean, what? what? It's personal preference. Right. <laughs> I, 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 I okay. think you're a better writer. Okay. But it's, oh, you know, it, it's, it is, I, I think there are new ways, like I said, to measure what, the way, what people are actually going to do. And I think that advertisers will learn to use those, you know, um, as opposed to focus groups, focus group, you know, if you focus group creative, if you ask enough people what kind of ice cream they want, you'll always end up with vanilla. So. All right. Now tell me, uh, I've heard, I'm hearing you now, do your clients agree with you when it comes to measurement pre and post? Because you're talking a lot more uh, effectiveness as opposed to testing the idea, you know? So do your clients agree with you, your, your big, your big clients. I think, I think our clients need to be educated just like we did, you know. Clients, are, you know, they're comfortable. Everybody is comfortable with what they've done. It's hard to get comfortable with doing something new. So I think that, I think you need to prove it to them. I th first of all, I think you need to be right. Um, and secondly, I, need, I think you need to be able to demonstrate it to them. You know, the whole point is to make it no longer a matter of opinion. It's no longer you're sitting across the table saying, I like this, you don't like this. It's a matter of saying, does it work? And if you can, I think if you can convince them, we can measure whether it works or not. Here are the numbers. Yeah, then they'll buy it. You know, and, and a lot of this technology is in early stages. I'm not positive it's proven yet. It's, it's, as far as I'm concerned, I believe it works because I've seen it work. Um, but learning a new process is always hard. Uh, Chuck, tell me, uh, you know, uh, given your sort of uh, immersion into technology as well as the creative part of the business, your interaction with clients, what are the clients' biggest concerns today? Because they have concerns, uh, you know, pushed by the stock market, they've got quarterly uh, reporting. They c it's nice to hear to say they shouldn't think long term, they need to think shorter term. That's not something the stock market is comfortable with. Well, I mean, the stock market, you know, basically the stock market, as far as I can tell, most publicly traded companies, right now, they're operating from quarter to quarter. Right. You know, they want to have a good quarter. So I think that it's, it's sort of the opposite of the, of the, you know, traditional Japanese way of doing things, which you think in generations, years, right. you know. Now they think in quarters. So I think, I think moving fast is something a lot of clients are going to embrace, and they are embracing it, you know. I don't want to wait six months to see your campaign plan. I don't want to see a plan for an entire year rollout of a campaign. I want to see something now and find out if it works. You know, one thing we've always believed in is, is working fast, doing a lot of different work, and then following the winners, you know, run stuff and see which one seems to, a long, long time ago, we did a, a a website, which was for Burger King, was called yes. the Subservient of Chicken. Course. Fantastic and, website. Yes. And, you know, we threw it Just up. We had no it. idea what would happen. We had no idea. People loved it. So that became a very fundamental part of their marketing for a while. Um, we did the same thing for Mini Cooper. We, we built a site for Mini Cooper that we thought was the most brilliant, interesting website idea ever. Nobody came. So we're like, okay, you know, you, you have to put it out there and see what happens and then follow a winner. I think that that's a process or, or, or a path that more and more clients are going to be interested in. I hope so. Now Chuck, uh, from what I hear, uh, both in the subservient chicken example as well as the Mini Cooper example, it requires a very high degree of trust between agency and client. How important is trust in this business? Is it more important today than it was 20 years ago? I don't know if it's more important today. Um, it's always important, you know, and, and in my experience, the way you gain the trust of a client is you have a big winner. You know, once you have a big, I mean, when we did that thing for Burger King, they didn't care about it. They're like, you know, just make us TV commercials. So we produced it ourselves. We paid the money to make that, and then it got 400 million hits, and they said, we want more of that. So, you know, trust comes from 
from success, I think. Uh, but I, I don't know that trust is more important now. I think probably, uh, probably proof is more important now, but it's so much easier and less expensive to get real effectiveness data now than it used to be because technology has made it possible. So I think that it, it's rather than saying, trust me, we think this is right, I think it's going to be more effective to go and say, we did this and we did this and we did this and here's how they did. Right. Okay, finally, I'll come to the last question, which is awards. You know, both it's becoming more and more expensive to take part. And one of the problems network agencies are complaining about is uh, there's too much money that uh, they have to put aside for the awards. Having said that, awards sort of ties up with what you said. It's proof. We won this, we won this, we won this, we won this. And uh, a bit of a conundrum there, isn't it? I mean, uh, you're, you're one of the most uh, awarded agency, creative agency of the decade, I think, once you, you got that. Uh, yes. I, I, I like awards because right. I believe awards are the way that little unknown agencies get. I mean, that's how we got known. You know, we won a bunch of stuff at Cannes and the phone started ringing, you know. Right. So I think it's a good way for talented people and for unknown but really capable agencies to get known. Um, and so... So I, I believe in well-judged award shows. The other thing, I, the other thing I like about well-judged award shows is that, is that scale doesn't matter. You know, two people sitting in a Starbucks doing ads have just as good a chance as the biggest agency in the world, and I like that. Right. Um, having said all that, can has gotten crazily expensive. Right. So you know, I think what's really going to happen. Um, I mean, I have been to Cannes a lot, a lot of times, um, and I've spoken there a lot of times, but I think what I see happening is people are gonna start peeling off from that big, gigantic, really expensive award show and, and find other, other award venues that will gain respect as we go along. So I think that, um, I think awards will continue to be important in terms of getting people known, hiring people, because people wanna go where they win awards, but I'm not sure it'll be can. Right. I think that there, there'll be other shows that will gain in importance. How important are what's the marketer? Should the marketers care? Because that's, again, one of the problems we've had with advertising awards. It's been a lovely party for yeah. the creative fraternity, but not for the marketer. Well, I think, I mean, now, Marketers love to go to Cannes because right. everybody loves to go to the South Is it loving to go to, go to Cannes or loving the recognition? Which one well, is Well, they it? like to go to the South of France. Yeah. But I, here's what I think. In my experience, we have certain clients who value awards and they think it's a validation. Can you, can you name them? Um, just... Well, I think that, you know, Burger King certainly love to win awards. Ferb was here. Huh? Uh, Machado was here at Met yeah, this year. Yeah, well, and they liked it. Yeah. Domino's has been our client forever. They love to win awards. They're very happy when they win awards. Um, Kraft is very happy when they win awards. We have had other clients who don't care at all. Um, and, you know, we have had some clients uh, who maybe have a little bit of a negative view. When we had Ikea, you know, Ikea was like, we don't care about awards. And actually, we, we we're kind of negative about awards. So I, I think it depends on the client. Right, fantastic. Thank you so much for talking to us. And hope to see we're you done? back in India soon. Yes, we're I done. I wish I would have said more funny things. <laughs> And that was an insightful conversation with Chuck Porter. And here are the key takeaways from the interview, or what we call the Melt Cheat Sheet. And that's a wrap on this edition of Melt. Uh, I'll see you next week, same time, same place. Don't forget to follow us on social media. Our handle is ready to melt. And next week, we'll be chatting with John Seifert, Global Community and Chairman at Ogilvy and Mather. Here's a sneak peek. Most of our clients are struggling to find growth. 